we both have to be open to the anger and open to whatever hurt or fear might be underneath the anger. Um, you know, there's the problem that when we bury feelings, we bury them alive. They, they, uh, they affect us in one way or another. They affect us psychophysiologically, if, if in no other way. So sometimes people want to skip over the anger because being angry doesn't fit with their view of themselves. You know, I'm not an angry person. I'm a nice person. Uh, sometimes it's a kind of spiritual bypass. I want to leap over this and get to warm and fuzzy feelings. And uh, part of it, I think, involves psychoeducation to help people to realize that it's it's just not going to work. I, we can be empathic to the wish to leap over it, but it's not going to work. So I think there's always a balance here where we're always balancing between, on the one hand, really letting ourselves feel the anger and letting the anger be a doorway to open to the hurt and the fear that might be underneath the anger, as well as not getting stuck in it, as well as at a certain point being able to release it. And it's a complex clinical judgment, I think, as to what's going to be most helpful. And I think we can engage our client in that judgment. I think we can say to them, if we're if we're sort of on the fence, to say to them, well, we understand that there's a need to both feel these feelings and also at a certain point to be able to let go so that you can live your life more fully. Where do you feel you are in that process? And they may well be able to um, opine about that. They may have a good sense of it. So let's say we come to the conclusion, which we probably will in working with our client, that there are costs to holding on to this anger. So what might we do about it? Well, one way to start is through mindfulness practice. It just happens to be a, a way that I work a lot. And this can start by moving out of kind of narrative into experiential reality. And narrative reality is when we're walking around talking to ourselves about ourselves all day long, you know, and thinking about how bad that person was and how good I was and the like. To shift out of that into what we might call experiential reality, which is simply the moment-to-moment -moment sensations of being embodied in this body, of noticing the breeze, of noticing the trees, noticing the sky and the like. And when we start to do this, we start to develop some metacognitive awareness. We start to notice that every time there's an angry thought, there's this angry arousal. Whenever there's the, the angry arousal, then we have more angry thoughts. And we start to see how the anger perpetuates itself in these kinds of loops. And we can also use our mindfulness practice or just general awareness to become aware of the hurt or fear underneath. Because whenever we're angry, it's because somewhere underneath we're hurt. And, and or we're frightened. And the anger is in the fight or flight response is to defend against that in some way. And we want to use our practice to be able to move toward that vulnerable emotion, to be able to welcome it, to be able to be self-compassionate about it, to be able to soften into it. Because if we're not able to be with the hurt or the fear that's under the anger, we're going to have to hold on to the anger. We're going to have to hold on to it as protection against that hurt or fear. And the second piece, I think, which is really important in, in working with this, once we've realized that there's a cost to the anger, is to really start to see the perpetrator more clearly. You know, um, I think Longfellow said that if we were to know the secret history of our enemies, there would be more than enough in each story to disarm us from our anger. I'm misquoting him, but that's it in paraphrase. And many, many people have pointed this out throughout history, that, that if we got it, the reason why other people do what they do, it's always out of their own hurt. It's always out of their own history. And, you know, <clears throat> you know, ultimately, this comes down to the analysis that says, if we had the other person, the perpetrators, exact genetics and their exact learning history, we'd be them. And of course we would do what they did. You know, it makes perfect sense. So the, you know, the fantasy that they're bad and we're good, you know, it's really based on this idea that somehow we wouldn't do what they did if we had been through their history. And of course we would. So that then brings us to the next step, which is deciding to forgive. And I think there's a lot of confusion around forgiveness. Oftentimes people resist this because they think that forgiving means condoning or justifying what the other person did. And that's not necessarily part of forgiving at all. We can decide what the person did was terribly unjust and even the person should be punished for it, but it's still different from holding on to the anger. And it's, we can do the forgiving just for ourselves. It doesn't mean we need to reconcile with the person that's hurt us in some way. We can just realize, I don't wanna be 
setting myself on fire anymore. I want to practice forgiveness in order to free myself from this. So we choose to not suppress the anger also. This is another part of it. We need to let it come and go. And then perhaps, if possible, also turn our attention to gratitude. And the gratitude part includes gratitude for the other things in our lives that are okay, that are maybe going better, but even perhaps gratitude for what maybe we've learned from this experience. Because, as a friend of mine put it, you know, I know many people who have been ruined by success, not that many who have been ruined by failure. You know, the bad things that happen are almost always lessons for us. We almost always get something out of it. This, the idea of post-traumatic growth comes to mind. And we can be grateful for whatever we've learned through this experience as well. And then finally, I'd say that there are some cases where we do want to reconcile. Some cases where we think, you know, this relationship might be salvageable. There's something valuable to being connected to this person. And then we want to move toward reconnecting. But if we're going to reconnect, we can only do it if it's potentially fruitful, right? We think there's something valuable to the relationship. And also, if we, we're probably going to need some kind of apology, right? Something that where we feel acknowledged by the other person that they get it, that we were injured here. And Part of that work involves working therapeutically with our client to figure out what do they need? Do they need to feel understood? Do they need to feel recognized? Do they need an admission of wrongdoing or, or, or guilt or something like that? And then perhaps helping them to ask for it. So it's a, it's a, there's a lot of different elements that are involved, I think, in, in being able to uh, help somebody move on from resentment. 